Wow. What did you, so in the course of four years, I mean, unpack for me what you found. I can only fathom. And when you said they've been out there for a year and a half, I mean, obviously I'm assuming they're going back to port to offload, but that's a long stretch of time out on the high ocean. Yeah. So your assumption is logical, but wrong. Um, so when near shore stocks collapse, something emerged called at sea transshipment. And so like the distant water fishing fleet, those guys that target foreign waters or high seas, mostly engage in transshipment at sea. So the fishing boats, and that's an economic choice. You send out a fishing vessel, the, the costliest thing, the thing that will make you in the red, not the black, is fuel and labor. And fuel is your biggie. So if you don't have to come back to shore and you can stay in the fishing grounds for a year straight and have a mothership come out, she brings ice, parts, men, yep. food, whatever, and she takes the stuff back. And then you're just gone the whole time. And those are the most brutal ships, transshipment at sea, distant water, transshipment vessels. Especially if you got a ship that's using foreign crew. So it's going to be Taiwanese, Korean, Chinese, um, New Zealand, whatever. And um, if the crew are foreign, then you got a real risk indicator. And if it's transshipment and if it's staying out longer than two years, there's a really good chance that bad stuff's happening there. Uh, anyway, but to your question, uh, um, I forgot your core question. I just, well, the <laughs> core digest. question is, you know, in four years and actually getting this level of access in different areas around the globe, I mean, I get, obviously it's a huge and broad question, but can you just unpack some of the things that you must have seen? Yeah, I mean, so getting on the vessels was an eye-opener. I bet on a lot before that, but I'd never, these are squid vessels. So we focused on the squid fleet because they're the most ships and they're the most notorious. They stay out at sea a long time. They travel the most. So we're like, okay, if we want to find the really dark stuff, let's aim at the Chinese squid fleet. Not the top, not the China ones because there's bigger money in that. And anyway, So we focus on the squid fleet. Squid ships are unusually gross because squid um, uh, uh, spray ink whenever they're panicking mm -hmm. and you deal with hundreds of thousands of tons of squid coming on board. So the entire ship is just layered in you know, oozy mucus, you know, walls, floor, accumulated over years. So, and then they work at night, uh, primarily with these massive bowling ball size bolts, hundreds of them. So you can see a, a squid jigger 80 miles away with plain sight. Um, they're so bright. Um, and they um, mostly use uh, forward crew, Indonesian, but before COVID, it was mostly Indonesian. Um, so we thought this is a good target ship to see what's going on human rights labor wise. Um, the, the living conditions, the food, um, the long hours, the captivity, you know, not being able to go back to home um, were really, really striking. A lot of malnutrition, a lot of berry berry, this disease. It's like you know, scurvy, but scurvy is depletion of vitamin C. Uh, berry berry berries, but not enough vitamin B1. Um, but it means your body starts blowing, bloating and retaining water and it can be fatal and it's painful and it's slow motion. It shouldn't be killing anyone. Um, so we're seeing a lot of Barry Barry. We're seeing a lot of guys that are captive. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, what we saw in terms of dramatic snapshots was that and a couple of really intense interactions. We also saw things that are dramatic, but statistical, right? So like one dead body every month and a half for the last eight years flat in one port alone is being offloaded by these vessels in Montevideo. That's one port and one inroad, and that's a death rate that's pretty striking. You know, and a lot of those guys are, you know, um, never being autopsied or whatever. It's just yeah. like, hey, this guy had asthma and he died, or this guy, um, but he's got crush marks. You know, like he's got, you know, things that don't make sense with asthma. So a lot of mysterious um, deaths um, coming off of those vessels. Um, so yeah, that, those were the most striking things. And then we looked at not just the at sea portion, but forced labor on land. So Uyghur, Xinjiang labor in China, in seafood, and then North Korean labor uh, in this other spot in, in uh, China and broke the story out. Like seafood's coming off of ships that are using captive labor, going into processing plants that are using captive labor, and then being shipped to us in the US and Europe. And so that was the big reveal. What is, how does that forced labor cycle end for the people that are trapped in it, whether on a vessel or onshore? Is it a certain amount of time and then they're 
passed along when they're no longer useful? I mean, is there even a light at the end of the tunnel for them? Yeah, I mean, so think of like the cap labor pro problem as a global problem. So if you're on the South China Sea, you're dealing with the Thai fleet, you're looking at Cambodians, Rohingya, Myanmar, Burma, uh, Laos, um, and the model is a certain thing. It's a guy you meet in Cambodia, you're from some poor village. He says you want a good job in middle class Thailand. I don't have any money. To sure, don't worry about it. Meet me here on Saturday, get in the back of the truck, I'll drive you across. You accrue a debt. He sneaks you into the country. You think you're going to a construction job. You end up at the ports. Off you go on the ship. And the captain pays the trafficker the debt that it costs coming in. And now the captain owns you. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's one model. And that's a huge model. There's a lot of guys, boys coming that way. Um, those guys escape usually by um, their captain you know, uses them and then sick of them. And he says, okay, fine, we can leave. Or they jump ship. And there's a good movie called Ghost Fleet about a, some islands in Indonesia where lots of these guys have jumped ship, swam to shore. They don't know where they are. They set up a new life and they stay there. And there's, they all have the same tale where they just ended up there and um, didn't know how to get home. So that's one model. Different model is a more incorporated model. That's like you're, you're in the Philippines, similar guy. You're a villager. You're not super savvy. You don't know what are the warning signs. A guy says, you know, there's no work here. But I could get you on a Taiwanese to the long line or doing fun things and making some real money. Cool. Yeah. Let me give it a go. Um, I've seen, I've heard some stories. That guy got a new pope, moped and that guy got a new roof on his mom's house. They both did some distant water fishing. So let me give it a go. You've got a company that's usually overseeing that. It's a manning agency. And these are like incorporated businesses. They're usually in another place like Singapore or Taiwan or wherever. And um, they handle the logistics of, filling up the ships and so they it's all contract and seemingly above board but it's the same game there's like yeah. all these hidden fees and your debt bonded and you get on the ship and you're the property the captain and you go off and in your contract i've read these contracts if you leave before the contract you don't get paid anything even if you were there for a year they can sell you boat to boat they knew all these crazy things that would never pass muster if you had that contract in front of you that's a different model those guys um maybe they get off by jumping ship somewhere and they go to an NGO or a union and say, could you help me? But most likely they got to do their tour and get off that way. 